Alright, I'm gonna try I'm gonna try chapter 18 again and see if I can do it right side up for you this time, okay? Alright, let's try this. Okay. Oops. Why do I always drop the book? Alright. Chapter 18. I throw myself into training with a vengeance. Eat, live, and breathe the workouts, drills, weapons, practice, lectures on chat tactics. A handful of us are moved into an additional class that gives me hope I may be a contender for the actual war. The soldiers simply call it the block, but the tattoo on my arm lists it as SSC, for short for Simulated Street Combat. Deep in the 13, they've built an artificial capital city block. The instructor breaks us into squads of eight, and we attempt to carry out missions, gaining a po position, destroying a target, searching a home as if we really fighting our way through the capital. The thing's rigged so that everything can go wrong for you does. A false step triggers a landmine. A sniper appears on a rooftop. Your gun jams. A crying child leads you into an ambush. Your squadron leader, who's just a voice on the program, gets hit by a mortar and you have to figure out what to do without orders. Part of you knows it's fake and that they're not going to kill you. If you set off a landmine, you hear an explosion and have to pretend to fall over dead. But in other ways, it feels pretty real in there. The enemy soldiers, dressed in peacekeepers' uniforms. The confusion of a smoke bomb. They even gas us. Johanna and I are the only ones who get our masks on in time. The rest of our squad gets knocked out for ten minutes. And the supposedly harmless gas I took a few lungfuls of gives me a wicked headache for the rest of the day. Cressida and her crew tape Johanna and me on the firing range. I know Gale and Finnick are being filmed as well. It's part of a new Propo series to show the rebels preparing for the capital invasion. On the whole, things are going well, pretty well. Then, PETA show, starts showing up for the, our morning workouts. The manacles, the handcuffs, are off, but he's still constantly accompanied by a pair of guards. After lunch, I see him across the field drilling with a group of beginners. I don't know what they're thinking. If a spat with Zelly can reduce him to arguing with himself, he's got no business learning how to assemble a gun. When I confront Plutarch, he assures me that it's all for the camera. They've got footage of Annie getting married and Johanna hitting targets, but all of Pan Am is wondering about PETA. They need to see that he's fighting for the rebels, not for Snow. And maybe if they could just get a couple of shots of the two of us, not kissing necessarily, just looking happy to be back together, I walk away from the conversation right then. That is not going to happen. In my rare down moments of downtime, I anxiously watch the preparations of the, for the invasions. See equipment and provisions ready, divisions assembled. You can tell when someone's getting ready, when someone's, I lost my place, when someone's ready, division assembled. You can tell when someone's received orders because they're given a very short haircut. When did you learn to do that? Sorry, guys. My nephew just learned how to climb up again. Uh, you can tell when someone's received orders because they're given a very short haircut. A chunk, a, a mark of a person going into battle. There's much talk. Of, that is your brother's homework. He will kill you if you rip that. Okay. Uh... There's very much talk of the opening offensive, which, which will be to secure the train tunnels that feed up to the capital. Just a few days before the first troops are to move out, York unexpectedly tells Johanna and me she's recommended us for the exam and we're to report immediately. There are four parts. An obstacle course that assesses your physical condition, written tactic exams, a test of weapons proficiency in a simulated combat situation in the block. I don't even have time to get nervous for the first three and do well. But there's a backlog at the block, some kind of technical bug they're working out. A group of us exchanges for information. This much seems true. You go through alone. There's no predicting what the situation you'll be thrown into. One of the boys says under his breath that he heard it's designed to target each person's weaknesses. My weaknesses? That's a door I don't even want to open. But I find a quiet spot and try to assess what that might be. That length of, that length, the length of the list depresses me. 
lack of physical brute force, a bare minimum of training, and somehow my, stati- my standout status as the Mockingjay doesn't seem as- to be an advantage in a situation where they're trying to get us to blend into a pack. They can nail me to the wall on any number of things. Johanna's called three ahead of me. I give her a nod of encouragement. I wish I had been at the top of the list now because I'm really overthinking the whole thing. By the time my name's called, I don't know what my strategy should be. Fortunately, once I'm in the block, a certain amount of training does kick in. It's an ambush situation. Whoop, I lost the place again. It's an ambush situation. I looked at the bottom of the page. Peacekeepers almost immediate, almost instantly have... I, and I, peacekeepers appear almost instantly, and I have to make my way to a rendezvous point to meet up with my scattered squad. I slowly navigate the street, taking out peacekeepers as I go. Two on the top rooftop to my left, another in a doorway up ahead. It's challenging, but not as hard as I was expecting. There's a nagging feeling that if it's too simple, I must be missing the point. I'm within a couple of buildings from my goal when things begin to heat up. Half a dozen peacekeepers come charging around the corner. They will outgun me, but I notice something. A drum of gasoline lying carelessly in the gutter. This is it. This is my test. To perceive that blowing up the drum will be the only way to achieve my mission. Just as I step out to do it, my squadron leader, who's been fairly useless up to this point, quietly orders me to hit the ground. Every instinct I have screams for me to ignore the voice, to pull the trigger, to blow up the peacekeeper, to blow the peacekeeper sky high. And suddenly I realize what the military will think my biggest weakness is. From my moments in the games, from when I ran out for that orange backpack, to the firefight in eight, To my impulsive race across the square in two, I cannot take orders. I smack the ground so hard and fast, I'll be picking gravel out of my chin for a week. Someone else blows the gas tank. The peacekeepers die. I make my rendezvous point. When I exit the block on the far side, a soldier congratulates me, stamps my hand with Squadron 415, and tells me to report to command. Almost giddy with success, I run through the halls, skid around the corners, bound down the steps because the elevator's too slow. I bang, I bang into something. I bang into the room before the oddity of the situation dawns on me. I shouldn't be in command. No, no, Remy. I shouldn't be in command. I should be getting my hair buzzed. People around the table aren't freshly minted soldiers, but the ones calling the shots. Bog smiles and shakes his head when he sees me. Let's see it. Unsure now, I hold out my stamped hand. You're with me. It's a special unit of sharpshooters. Join your squad. He nods over at the group lining the wall. Gail, Finnick, five others I don't know. My squad. I'm not only I'm not only in, I got to work under Boggs with my friends. I force myself to take calm, deep, calm breaths, suddenly take calm, sudden, soldierly steps. Hold on. Hey, stop. Here, over here. There. I force myself to take calm, soldierly steps to join them instead of jumping up and down. We must be important, too, because we're in command, and it has nothing to do with a certain Mockingjay. Plutarch stands over a wide, flat panel in the center of the table. He's explaining something about the nature of what we will encounter in the capital. I'm thinking this is a terrible presentation because even on tiptoe I can't see what's on the panel until he hits a button. A holographic image of the block of the capital projects into the air. This, for example, is an area surrounding one of the peacekeepers' barracks. Not unimportant, but the, not the most crucial of targets, and yet look. Plutarch enters a code on the keyboard, and lights begin to flash. They're an assortment of colors and blink at different speeds. Each light is called a pod. It represents a different obstacle, the nature of which could be anything from a bomb to a band of mutts. Make no mistake, whatever it contains, it is designed to either trap you or kill you. Some, of, some have been in place since the dark days. 
Others have developed over years. To be honest, I created some of them a fair number myself. This program, which one of our people absconded with when we left the Capitol, is our most recent information. They don't know where they don't know we have it. But even so, it's likely that the new pods have been activated in the first few months, in the last few months. This is what you will face. I'm unaware that my feet are moving to the table until I'm inches from the holograph. Remy, don't break your foot. We can't go to the hospital. My hand reaches in and erupts and cups a rapidly blinking green light. Someone joins me. His body tense. Finnick, of course, because only a victor would see what I see so immediately. The arena, laced with pods, controlled by game makers. Phoenix fingers caress a steady red glow over the doorway. Ladies and gentlemen, his voice is quiet. Mine rings through the room. Let the 76 Hunger Games begin. Yeah, he's lifting weights. I laugh quickly before anyone has time to register what lies beneath the words I have just uttered. Before eyebrows are raised, objections are uttered, and two and two are put together. The solution is that I should be kept as far away from the capital as possible because an angry, independently thinking victor with a layer of psychological scar tissue too thick to penetrate is maybe the last person you want on your squad. I don't even know why you bothered to put Finnick and me through the training, Plutarch, I say. Yeah, we're already the two best equipped soldiers you have, says Finnick, co adds, Finnick adds cockily. So he's get, they're getting kind of arrogant there, guys. That's probably not a good thing. Do not think, do not think that that fact escapes me, he says with an impatient wave. Now get back in line, soldiers O'Dare and Everdeen. I have a presentation to finish. We retreat to our places, ignore the questioning looks thrown our way. I adopt an attitude of extreme concentration as Plutarch continues, nodding my head here and there. Shifting my position to get a better view, all the while telling myself to hang on until I can get a view of the woods, and or scream, or curse, or cry, or maybe all three at once. If this was a test, Finnick and I both passed it. When Plutarch finishes, the meeting's adjourned. I have a bad moment when I learn there's a special order for me, but it's merely that I skipped the military haircut because they would like the Mockingjay to look as much like the girl in the arena as possible at the anticipated surrender. For the cameras, you know. I shrug to communicate that my hair length's a matter of, in of complete indifference to me. They dismiss me without further comment. Finnick and I gravitate toward each other in the hallway. What'll I tell Annie, he mutters under his breath. Nothing, I answer. That's what my mother and sister will be hearing from me. Bad enough, we know we're heading back into a fully equipped arena. No use dropping it on our loved ones. If she sees that holograph, he begins, she won't. It's classified information. It must be, I say. Anyway, it's not like an actual games. Any number of people will survive. We're just overreacting because, well, you know why. You still want to go, don't you? Of course, I want to destroy snow as much as you do, he says. It won't be like the others, I say firmly, trying to convince myself as well. Then the real beauty of the situation dawns on me. This time, Snow will be a player too. Before we can continue, Hamish appears. He wasn't at the meeting, isn't thinking of arenas, but something else. Johanna's back in the hospital. I assumed Johanna was fine, had passed her exams, but simply wasn't assigned to the sharpshooters unit. She's wicked throwing an axe, but about average with a gun. Is she hurt? What happened? It's what, it was while she was back on the block. They try to figure out a soldier's potential weaknesses, so they flooded the street, says Hamish. This doesn't help. Johanna can swim. At least I seem to remember her swimming around some in the quarter quell. Not like Finnick, of course, but none of us are like Finnick. So? That's how they tortured her in the capital. Soaked her and then used electric shock, says Hamish. In the block, she had some kind of flashback. Panicked, didn't know how, didn't know where she, didn't know where she was. She's back under sedation. Finnick and I just stand there as if we've lost the ability to respond. I think of the way Johanna never showers, how she forced herself into the rain like it was acid that day. 
I had attributed her misery to the morphling withdrawal. You two should go see her. You're as close to friends as she's got, says Hamish. That makes the whole thing worse. I don't know when, when, what's between Johanna and Finnick, but I hardly know her. No family, no friends, not so much as a token from Seven to set beside her regulation clothes in her anonymous drawer. Nothing. I'd better go to, I'd better go tell Plutarch. He won't be happy, Hamish continues. He wants as many victors as possible for the cameras to follow into the capital. Thinks it makes for a better television. Are you and Beatty going, I ask? As many young and attractive victors as possible, Hamish corrects himself. So no, we'll be here. Finnick goes directly down to see Johanna, but I linger outside for a few minutes until Boggs comes out. He's my commander now, so I guess he's the one to ask for any special favors. When I tell him what I want to do, he writes me a pass so that I can go into the woods during reflection, provided I stay within sight of the guards. I run to my compartment, thinking to use the parachute, but it's so full of ugly memories. Instead, I go across the hall and take one of the white cotton bandages I brought from 12. Square, sturdy, just the thing. In the woods, I find a pine tree and strip handfuls of the fragrant needles from the bows. After making a neat pile in the middle of the bandage, I gather up the sides, give them a twist, and tie them tightly with a length of vine, making an apple-sized bundle. At the hospital room door, I watch Johanna for a moment and realize that most of her ferocity is in her abrasive attitude. Stripped of that now as she is, there's only a slight, young woman, her wide eyes set, fighting to stay awake against the power of the drugs, terrified of what sleep will bring. I cross to her and hold out the bundle. What's that, she says hoarsely. Damp edges of her hair form little spikes all over her head. I made it for you. Something to put in your drawer? I place it in her hands. Smell it. She lifts the bundle to her nose and takes a tentative sniff. Smells like home. Tears flood her eyes. That's what I was hoping. You being from seven and all, I say. Remember when we met? You were a tree... Well, briefly. Suddenly she has my wrist in an iron grip. You have to kill him, Katniss. Don't worry. I resist the temptation to wrench my arm free. Swear it on something you care about, she hisses. I swear it on my life. But she doesn't let go of my arm. On your family's life, she insists. On my family's life, I repeat. I guess my concern for my own survival isn't compelling enough. She lets go and I rub my wrist. Why do you think I'm going anyway, brainless? That makes her smile a little. I just needed to hear it. She presses the bundle of pine needles to her nose and closes her eyes. The remaining days go by in a whirl. After a brief workout each morning, my squad's on the shooting range full time in training. I practice mostly with a gun, but they also allow me they also reserve an hour a day for specialty weapons which means I get to use my Mockingjay bow, Gale, his heavily militarized one. The trident Beatty designed for Fennec has a lot of special features, but their most remarkable is that he can throw it, press a button on the metal cuff on his wrist, and return it to his hand without chasing it down. Sometimes we shoot at peacekeeper dummies to, to become familiar with the weaknesses in their protective gear, the chinks in the armor, so to speak. If you hit flesh, you're rewarded with a burst of fake blood. Our dummies are soaked in red. It's reassuring to see just how high the overall level of accuracy is in our group. Along with Finnick and Gale, the squad includes five soldiers from 13. Jackson, a middle-aged woman whose bogs is second command, looks kind of sluggish but can hit things the rest of us can't even see without a scope. Farsighted, she says. There's a pair of sisters in their 20s named League. We call them League One and League Two for the clarity. Sue are so familiar in uniform, I can't tell them apart unless I notice League One has weird yellow flecks in her eyes. The two older guys, Mitch and Hol Mitchell and Holmes, never say much but can shoot the dust off your boots at 50 yards. I see the other squads who that are also quite good but don't fully understand our status until the morning Plutarch joins us. Squad 451, you have been selected for special mission, he begins. 
I bite the inside of my lip, hoping against hope it's to, to assassinate Snow. We have numerous sharpshooters, but rather de but a rather death of current camera crews. Therefore, we've handicapped, handpicked the eight of you to be what we call our star squad. You will be the on face scene, see, the on face, uh, the, the, you will be the on screen faces of the invasion. Disappointment, shock, and anger run through our group. What do, what you're saying is, whoops, what you're saying is we won't be in actual combat, snap scale. You will be in combat, but perhaps not always on the front lines. If one can't even isolate a front line of this type of war, says Plutarch. None of us wants that, Phoenix remark is followed by a general rumble of assent. But I stay silent. We're going to fight. You're going to be as useful to the war effort as possible, says Plutarch, and it's been decided that you are of most value on television. Just look at the effect Katniss had running around in the Mockingjay suit. Turned the whole rebellion around. Do you notice how she's the only one not complaining? It's because she understands the power of the screen. Actually, Katniss isn't complaining because she has no intention of staying with the Star, star Squad but she recognizes the necessity of getting to the capital before carrying out any plan. Still, to be too compliant may arouse suspicion as well. But it's not all pretend, is it, I ask? That'd be a waste of talent. Don't worry, Plutarch tells me. You'll have plenty of real targets to hit. But don't get blown up. I've got enough on my plate without having to replace you. Now get to the capital and put on a good show. The morning, we, the morning we ship out, I say goodbye to my family. I haven't told them how much the Capitol's defenses mirror the weapons in the arena, but my going off to war is awful enough on its own. My mother holds me tightly for a long time. I feel tears on her cheek, something she suppressed when I was slated for the games. Don't worry, I'll be perfectly safe. I'm not even a real soldier, just one of Plutarch's televised puppets, I reassure her. Prim walks me as far as the hospital doors. How do you feel? Better knowing you're somewhere Snow can't reach you, I say. Next time we see each other, we'll be free of him, she says Prim firmly. Then she throws her arms around my neck. Be careful. I consider saying a final goodbye to Peta, decide it would only be bad for both of us, but I do slip the pearl into the pocket of my uniform, a token of the boy with the bread. A hovercraft takes us to all of, of all places, 12, where a makeshift transport area has been set outside the fire zone. No luxury trains this time, but a cargo par, car, but a cargo par, but a cargo car packed to the limit with soldiers in their dark gray uniforms, sleeping with their heads on their packs. After a couple days travel, we disembark inside one of the mountain tunnels leading into the capital and make the rest of the six-hour trek on foot, taking care to step only on the glowing green paint line that marks safe passage to air above. The com we come out in the rebel encampment, a ten-block stretch outside the train station where Peta and I made our previous arrivals. It's crawling with soldiers. Squad 451 is assigned a spot to pitch its tents. This area has been secured for over a week. The rebels pushed out the peacekeepers, losing hundreds of lives in the process. The capital forces fell back and have regrouped farther into the city. Between us lie the booby-trapped streets, the empty and inviting. Each one will need to be swept to the pods before we can advance. Mitchell asks about hover planes bombing, and we do feel very naked at pitched out in the open, but Boggs says it's not an issue. Most of the capital's air fleet was destroyed in two or during the invasion. If it has any craft left, it's holding on to them, probably so Snow and his inner circle can make a last-minute escape to some presidential bunker somewhere if needed. Our own hover planes were grounded after the capital's anti-aircraft missiles decimated the first few waves. This war will be battled out on the streets with, hopefully, only superficial damage to the infrastructure and a minimum of hu human casualties. The rebels want the capital, just as the capital wanted 13. After three days of, after three days, much of Squad 451 risked deserting out of boredom. Cressida and her team may take shots of us firing. They tell us we're part of the disinformation team. 
If the rebels only shoot Plutarch's pods, it will take the capital about two minutes to realize that they have we have the holograph. So there's a lot of time spent shattering things that don't matter to throw them off the scent. We mostly just add to the piles of rainbow glass that's been blown off the exteriors of the candy-colored buildings. I suspect they're intercutting this footage with the destruction of significant capital targets. Once in, a while, once in a while, it seems that a real sharpshooter services are needed. Eight hands go up, but Gail, Finnick, and I are never chosen. It's your own fault for being so camera ready, I tell Gail. If looks could kill. I don't think that they quite know what to do with the three of us, particularly me. I have my Mockingjay outfit with me, but I've only been taped in my uniform. Sometimes I use a gun. Sometimes they ask me to shoot with my bow and arrows. It's as if they don't want to entirely lose the Mockingjay, but they want to downgrade the role to foot my role to foot soldier. Since they don't care, it's amusing. Since I don't care, it's rather amusing than upsetting to imagine the arguments going on back in 13. While, outwardly while I outwardly express discontent about our lack of any real participation, I'm busy with my own agenda. Each of us has a paper map of the capital. The city forms an almost perfect square. Lines divide up the map into smaller squares, with letters along the top and numbers down the side to form a grid. I consume this, noting every intersection and side street, but it's remedial stuff. The commanders here are working off Plutarch's holog holog holograph. Uh, each has a handheld contraption called a hob holo that produces images like I saw in command. They can zoom into any area of the grid and see what pods await them. The holo is an in independent unit, a glorified map really, since it, it can neither send nor receive signals but it's far superior to my paper version. A hollow is activated by a specific commander's voice giving his or her name. Once it's working, it responds to the other voices in the squadron. So if, say, Boggs were killed or severely disabled, someone else could take over. If anyone in the squad repeats Nightlock three times in a row, the hollow will explode, blowing up everything in a five-yard radius sky high. For this security reason, in the event of capture, it's understood that we would all do this without hesitation. So what I need to do is steal Boggs' activated hollow and clear out before he notices. I think it would be easier to steal his teeth. In the fourth morning, Soldier League is, hits a mislabeled pod. It doesn't unleash the swarm of mutts, gnats, which the rebels are prepared for, but shoots out a sunburst of metal darts. One finds her brain. She's gone before the medics can reach her. Plutarch promises a speedy replacement. The following evening, the newest member of our squad arrives with no man manacles, no, no um, handcuffs, no guards, strolling out of the train station with his gun swinging from a strap over his shoulder. There's shock, confusion, resistance, but 415 is stamped on the back of Peter's fresh ink hand. Boggs relieves himself of his weapon. I'm sorry, Bog relieves him of his weapon and goes to make a call. It won't matter, Peter tells the rest of us. The president assigned me herself. She decided the propos need some heating up. Maybe they do. But if Coin sent Peter here, she's decided something else as well that I'm of more use to her dead than alive. All right, so PETA has just joined um, Katniss's squad. So he is signed up for uh, uh, squad 451. And apparently they, they think that he is ready to fight and they gave him a gun. You guys think that's a good thing? Thumbs up or a bad thing? Thumbs down. It doesn't... Not quite sure I'm convinced he's ready for that, but we are ready for part three, the assassin.